Good morning. Several years ago, there was a, a group of students who decided to get involved in cross country. Now, if you've ever watched a cross country meet, they're crazy. They go outside and they run in these incredibly long laps, sometimes around like a complete golf course, and they're, they're running, and it's not just like this nice smooth track that they're running across. Oh no, it's up hills, it's down hills, it's through trees, it's through gravel roads, it's just crazy. Now here's the fun part too, because of the season in which cross country runs, the weather can be anything. First time I went, this kid says, you gotta come watch me. And I said, I'll come watch you run. But I didn't realize what that meant for me watching that you were also going to be running. Because you have to run to certain points to make sure that you can see who's running and, and where they're running and how they're doing and stuff like that. But it's also cold. I was freezing. I was like, I was not expecting to be out there just shivering watching them run. But there was something very interesting as I watched this race and they're running and I'm like, you know, I'm like, these kids are just running and running and running and running. But then they get to that point where they start the last lap. And it's almost like something inside of them clicks. Before that, they, they were, you know, they would have been like tired and they're like, this is lap four. And they're just running and they feel really sluggish. But then they realize it's that last lap. It's the final lap. And suddenly, it seems like they get some energy from within them that they didn't know was even there. And they start running. And they start getting a little bit faster, but it gets even better. As they come around, there's one track that's forever just etched in my mind. They would come around this curve after coming up a hill. And they would come around this curve and you could see the finish line in the distance. Now these kids had just trudged up a hill. They were tired. They were beat. But they turn that corner. They see the finish line. It is the home stretch. And I have watched and I'm like, I don't know how they did it. I don't know where they got the energy from. But all of a sudden, suddenly it's like they are running. Some of them even pass people in this, in this, in this home stretch. They are sprinting. They're moving. Because they saw the end was coming and they wanted to finish well and they wanted to give it everything they had. They cross the finish line and it's always very interesting because there's several different responses. Most of them can't breathe at that point. Um, their, their lungs are just burning. Some of them don't, they get across the finish line, they just, boom, hit the ground. They're like, my legs are jello. I cannot move anymore. But they have given it everything they have. In life, we may not know when the end of our race may be. But here's the reality. With each passing day, we're closer. I remember when I was in my 20s thinking, man, I've got a long life ahead of me. Now I'm in my 40s, I'm like, it's getting closer. But every day we get a little bit closer and we don't know when that day is that we will cross that finish line. But as we approach what we may be thinking is the home stretch of life, suddenly what is important becomes pretty clear. Suddenly, things that you want people to know, you tell them. Relationships that you want mended, you mend because you know that the end is near. You see that finish line and suddenly all those things, you're like, I'll never do that. You're like, you know, what's really of most importance? It becomes pretty clear. In 2 Timothy, Paul is writing these final thoughts to his child in the faith, Timothy. And as he believes that he is in the home stretch of life, he's sitting in this Roman prison. He's mentioned in this letter that he, he believes that his life will soon be coming to an end. And as Paul looks at this home stretch, there's things that he wants to make sure that Timothy, this man that he has discipled, that he has poured himself into, he wants to make sure that Timothy knows. There's going to be two really incredible lessons that we're going to look at that as we look at the first part of 2 Timothy chapter 4. But even though this was written from Paul, the apostle sitting in a Roman prison, to Timothy, who's a young leader in the church, there's things today that we need to take and learn as well. There's some principles that we had better pay attention to, just like Timothy needed to pay attention to from the apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we're going to be, but as we get ready to dive into God's words, let's take a moment and uh, let's go before the throne. Father, we thank you. We thank you for another day that you've given us. 
another opportunity that we've been able to meet together. To be able to worship you through music. To be able to, to fellowship with one another. And God, if we come to this point now where we're going to get into your word. Father, we pray that you would use it in our lives. Father, I pray that you would remove distractions that are so easy to come in. That you would help us to not think about all the things that maybe we have to do the rest of the day. But may we take this moment, this time together, as we get into your word and really just focus on, God, what is it today that you want to teach me? How is it today, God, that you want to change me? God, may we be quick to be obedient to you. Father, we thank you for your word that we have. How you have preserved and protected it throughout the centuries. Thank you for the guide that it gives us through life. Instruction on how man can be made right with you. On how we can live a life that is pleasing to you. The warnings, the challenges, the instructions, the encouragement. Father, we thank you for them. Father, may we not walk out of here the same. And it's your precious name that we pray. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 1. As we start to look at these two lessons, these two big lessons, this challenge and a conclusion that, that Paul is going to be giving. The first one is this. We need to shout to those who are sinking. Shout to those who are sinking. This is the first big challenge that we're going to see that Paul gives Timothy here. And starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We read this and we'd be like, this is great, this is awesome, here's the problem. So many times the church loves its safe space. Here's what I mean by that. So many times as a church, we're like, we want it to be exactly what we want. I want to walk in. I want to know everybody. I want to be friends with everybody. And if you're a little bit on the outside, a little bit of a fringe, we want to, I don't know. We don't want to let evil in. We want the church to be this nice, protected, pretty place. But as we look at what Paul is telling Timothy, we look at that is not really going to be an option. Because so many times, this is our view, and we may not state this, we may not say this, but here's the unfortunate reality. Sometimes this is what we think. You know, there's a time in my life when I gave my life to Christ. For me, I was a five-year-old little boy kneeling by my bed. My mom led me to Christ, beside, sitting there with my brother. Awesome. That day, my life changed. That day, I went from sinking in the, the ocean of sin to my life now having a life preserver. That I am, I am now, I am safe I'm protected. I will not drown. My future is secure. And I'm good. But here's the problem. So many times that's how we live. We live in our little Christian bubble of I've got my life preserver of salvation and I'm good. I'm good. Life is good. It's all just good. And we like to just kind of just float around. But as we're going to see as we get into this passage, there's so much more that we got to be doing. Because if we're just floating, I think we're missing the point. So Paul starts off in this passage remembering who Timothy is. Timothy is younger. He's not Paul. As you look at the Apostle Paul, you see a guy who's not afraid to say anything to anyone. He's kind of fearless, you could say. I mean, when he's writing to these churches, he tells them, here's how it's going to be. You're wrong. You have Timothy who's like, but I, Paul, I'm not you. 
I'm a little younger. I'm a little timid. I'm facing some difficult circumstances in the church. And then as we look at this, this letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, he reminds him in, this, in this, this section of shouting out to those who are sinking of three things that he needs to remember, three things that he needs to know, and we do as well this morning. The first one is this. We need to know your mission. Know your mission. I love how this starts off in verse 1. He says, I charge you. Now, a lot of times we just read scripture and we're just like fly through some of these words and we're like, okay, I charge you. And we think nothing of it. But you have to look and dig dig a little bit deeper. This is a serious command. It's not a suggestion. It's not if you want to. It's not I wish you would. It's like I charge you. Do it. That's what Paul is telling the Timothy. This is something you must do. He says, I charge you this forceful command. We're going to find out what follows needs to be listened to extremely carefully. The magnitude of this charge is what follows in the rest of verse 1. It says, I charge you in the presence of God. This should cause you to sit up a little bit. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God. God is going to be a witness to what Paul is telling Timothy here. This charge is going to be witnessed by God. The original language is kind of fun as you look at it. If you look at the rest of the verse, would actually say it in this way. In the presence of God, even Jesus Christ. Now here's where it gets fun. He says, this charge is not only in the presence of God the Father and of Jesus. Now look at how it describes Jesus. It says, the judge of the living and the dead... And by or because of his appearing, his resurrection, and his kingdom. Now you put all this together, it says this command is given in the presence of Jesus, who is the judge, he is the risen king, and he now reigns. This is a serious command that is given. It's imagine being in the military, and your commanding officer gives you a command. It carries some weight. You have to listen. Now imagine if the Secretary of Defense was standing beside your commanding officer. Suddenly it's like everything is on a whole new level. The seriousness of it all has now just gone completely through the roof. It takes on a whole new perspective. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ. Listen to what the command is. We start to find out the mission. And it's actually really short. He says, preach the word. Preach the word. To preach means to proclaim or to herald publicly. Now, you, as we look at who Timothy was, we may be able to find out and kind of speculate a little bit about why Timothy maybe had needed this, this charge, this challenge from the Apostle Paul. He's young. He's timid. He's in a challenging work. You know, Paul has this strong, aggressive spirit. That's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is the guy that's like, oh, there's a town that doesn't know Jesus. Let's go. But it's 10 miles uphill. I don't care. Let's go. But you you know, you you see Paul's life. You're going to be shipwrecked if you go. All right, let's go. That's the Apostle Paul. You're going to get beaten if you go to that city. Okay. That's the Apostle Paul. And Timothy's a complete different person. He says, I'm not like the Apostle Paul. Maybe he felt a little bit inadequate or intimidated. But he's given this command to preach the word. Now, how is he to do this? And this is where it starts to get really fun. It says, be ready always, in season or in out of season. Always be ready. I love when I watch people, they post videos from their trail cams as they're out hunting, and they fall asleep. And while they're sleeping and the video catches them snoozing against the tree, they see that's a ginormous buck walk by. They weren't ready. And when when Paul is telling Timothy here, he says, when it comes to preaching the word, be ready always. Not when it's convenient, not when I feel like it. Continuously be ready. Always ready. Always prepared. What else is he supposed to do? He says to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reprove means to call out wrong beliefs and lifestyles. Rebuke, to correct those to get them on the right path. To exhort means to encourage. One commentator put it this way, say that to reprove hits the mind, rebuke hits the heart, and exhort is the encouragement to take the action on what they need to know, understand, and believe. It's like, man, so we're supposed to be doing this, but how are we to do it? Paul goes on to give more on to how we are to do this. says, with complete patience and teaching with complete patience and teaching because you can imagine Timothy's like all right Paul you tell me to preach the word to be ready always to rebuke to correct to exhort 
I've been doing that, but it seems like nothing's changing. With all, with complete patience and teaching. Time is needed for those hearing the word to take it to heart to make the necessary changes. Preaching is proclaiming, this heralding out. Teaching is explaining. You may be thinking this morning, I'm glad that I'm not a preacher because this doesn't apply to me. I have dodged a bullet on this one. This is a passage you're probably just preaching to yourself, Jeff. Here's the reality of this. This just isn't for me, just isn't for those who are pastors. There's an application for all of us if we know Christ. There's a command, there's an accountability to the Father, to Jesus. Freshman mission class in college, my professor, Dr. Alban, incredible man. One of the first sessions of class, he would ask a simple question. Who's a missionary? Now, in our minds, you know, we think back to, well, who's, whose picture did we see on the fridge growing up? Those are the missionaries, right? And he would, he would challenge us, and he had a great way of doing this, and he had this simple definition of who is a missionary, and he would come back to, the, here's this, what it is. He says, every believer is an immediate missionary for Christ. If you, name, if you name the name of Christ, you're a missionary. Now, I, going into a, a missions class, I was, it, that kind of hit me because we're often thinking, oh, the missionaries are the ones that, you know, they raise support, they go overseas, you know, they learn a new language or whatever. But he says, every believer is an immediate missionary for Christ. If you know Christ, you're a lot like Noah. Noah is called a preacher or a proclaimer of righteousness. If your life has been changed by Jesus, this is your description. This is the mission that you have, this mission to share the good news of Jesus with others. Preach the word. Are you ready? Are you ready? Paul tells Timothy, be ready in season, out of season, whenever. Be ready to preach. Be ready to proclaim the incredible good news. But it's so easy, but Jeff, you know, if we're in the home stretch and Jesus is coming soon, shouldn't we just drift ashore? Just kind of just coast on in? As we're going to see in the next couple of verses, there's no way that this can be what we do. Are we ready? Yesterday, our students spent seven hours here. They spent basically a full day of work at church, learning how to share their faith. Volunteers gave up their Saturday to be here. Why? Because I want everyone, I want our students ready to share. I want them to not be in that situation where it's like, I don't know what to say. True story, I will never forget this. I was early, in, or early on in ministry. I'd only been a youth pastor for just a really short time. We had some repairmen working at the church, and I was walking through the church one day. And this repairman was there, sitting there eating his lunch. And, you know, I was just going to give him a, you know, a simple, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. He stops and goes, hey, what do you believe? After I regained my composure, because you don't just get asked that question just from a, from a repairman sitting there on the steps eating his lunch. But the reality hit me. It's like, I need to be ready whenever, wherever, whether it's walking through the church, whether it's walking through a store, to always be ready. Always be ready to proclaim the truth of the gospel. We need to know our mission. The second thing we need to do is to know the truth. Know the truth. Look what it says, for the time is coming, by the way, when it says time, this is referring to a period of time. There's a period of time coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears to accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Here's the reality. If you're looking for a teacher that teaches what you want to hear, you can find it. You can find it. When it talks about they find a, a teacher with, an, with, you know, they have itchy ears. It's like, I want to hear what I want to hear. I want something that matches me. I want it to match my lifestyle, my preferences, my passions, my beliefs. That's what I want. That's the kind of, I want the teacher that's best for me. 
Now we notice one of the things that they have done is says they will not endure sound teaching. There is a rejection of truth. And it's so easy to say, but Jeff, you know, come on. It's not that bad. There's not that much falsehood flying around out there. I spent some time on the internet this week. Pray for your staff, because when I have to read a lot of false stuff like this, it just gets to me after a while. And then I have to share it with them. I'm like, can you believe this? But I want to read to you some things that are out there that well-known, popular teachers are teaching that fall into this category of, of teachers who say what they say because they're following their own passions. They're not following truth. One well-known teacher of our day, this is what they say. They're in this talking about special revelation. By the way, we don't need any more additional revelation. God has given us his word. It is complete. It is finished. If somebody says, I have a new message from God. No, you don't. No, you don't. If, it's, if, it, they didn't get, if they not say, hey, I've read this verse in scripture, then you know that there's a problem. The red flag should be going up and something is wrong. But here's what this, this well-known teacher says about the area of special revelation. It says the Bible can't even find a way to explain this. That's why you've got to get it by revelation. There are no words to explain what I'm telling you. I've got to just trust God that he's putting it into your spirit like he's putting it into mine. What could go wrong? There's no guide. There's no standard. It's like, this is what God has told me to tell you. It could be anything. Run it through Scripture. Run it through Scripture. They also go on to say that they're no longer a sinner. They just lied. So anyway, another one, very well-known, very well-known teacher in our world. When they were point-blank asked... In an interview, if there was more than one way to get to heaven, they would not give a straight answer. They wouldn't give a straight answer. They had this golden opportunity. Let me tell you, preachers and, and pastors who love truth, they love this opportunity. When somebody says, hey, can you share how someone's life can be changed? How does one get to heaven? If, a, if there's a pastor who loves truth, they're like, yeah, baby, let's go. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the gospel. But they wouldn't even, they'd be like, well, you know, no, we don't want to get into that. Why? Because it may offend someone. The gospel is offensive. It's saying your life is wrong and Jesus is right. But they wouldn't commit to that. They go on to say this as well. God has already done everything he's going to do. The ball is now in your court. If you want success, if you want wisdom, if you want to be prosperous and healthy, you're going to have to do more than meditate and believe. You must boldly declare words of faith and victory over yourself and your family. The whole name it and claim it. If I proclaim it with enough faith, then God will give it to me. That is nowhere found in Scripture. Nowhere. But it's very popular and it's a huge message in our world today. Another well-known pastor has said this. He stated that he did not believe that homosexual conduct to be sinful. I'm not sure what Bible he's reading. How about this? He went on to say, it's really hard to condemn someone to eternal damnation on the basis of their religion when you know them well and have come to love them. If you love them, don't you want them to know truth? Don't you want their life to be changed? Well, I love them too much. I can't say that it could offend them. That's not loving. That's very unloving. Another one, very well-known teacher. He said that people who don't know Christ, even those of other religions which completely reject Jesus completely, says that they will nevertheless unconsciously be saved through Christ. I've read my Bible. I've never seen that. Jesus made it very clear. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him, except through him. And yet so many times we see, we see so much where it's, it's anything goes and you can find a teacher that'll tell you exactly what you want to hear. It's like, I want to live this lifestyle. And you can find a teacher who'll say, yes, that's fine. Scripture says that's okay. And as you research this, and, and I would almost tell you not to because it'll make your mind explode. But as you read this, you're like, they're so deceived. But these people said that they have fed a... They want the teacher to tell them exactly what they want to hear. 
That's what they're wanting. They're want, they have those itchy ears and they want someone to tell them exactly what will make them feel good. Another, another well-known teacher has come out with some books and he's even come basically flat out said that there is no hell. And that hell is the bad things we go through in this life. As you look at what Jesus says about the reality of hell, which he spoke about more than heaven, you know that that can't be the case. Thomas White, who's a professor at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, we can read this quote. This is a good one. Here's what he said. He says, anyone who denies hell and supports universalism, that everybody's going get to get to heaven, falls into a long line of heretics serving the ruler of this world, asking, has God said, and then twisting God's word with an intellectual sleight of hand that is neither creative nor unique. We know that Jesus spoke of hell often. If the Bible is true, so is hell. It all comes down to, do we believe what Scripture says? Do we? That has got to be the basis when we say, well, I'm a follower of Christ. How do we not get duped? How do we not get pulled aside? And how do we not fall into the, the, the trap and the prey of listening or reading or believing something that's not true? You've got to run it through Scripture. As the days go by, we need to be more and more in God's Word. If we know the truth, then we can start to spot the lie. It says they won't continue with sound teaching. By the way, the word here for sound carries the idea of healthy teaching. It's where we get our word hygiene. You can start to see kind of where that would flow. They've heard the truth, but they wander away to follow myths. And we're all like, how can this happen to people? You know, as we look at the nation of Israel, so many times we just shake our heads and go, those poor people. When you think about how God delivered them from Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt and God delivered them. They had seen what happened. They had seen the Red Sea part and they walked through on dry ground. How incredible is that? They get out into the wilderness. Moses goes up on the mountain and he's up getting, talking with God, having a conversation with God, getting the Ten Commandments. And what do the people say? Hey, Aaron, he's been gone for a long time. Uh, what do you want to do? And he's like, bring me your gold earrings. Let's uh, throw them in the fire. Let's melt together. Let's make a calf. And he says in, in Exodus chapter 32, he says, behold, Israel, here is your God. Here is the God that brought you out of Egypt. They'd seen what God had done. They'd heard truth. They knew who God was. And yet at the opportune time, they just completely went the other direction to serve and to follow an idol. To follow something that is not true. People will commit themselves to this. Exodus 32, 6, it says they rose up early the next day and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. This is to the golden calf. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What they basically did was they started to mimic the Egyptian worship. And there, there's, there's some, a little bit of debate on what does it mean when it says that they rose up to play. Was this just some, you know, religious festivities or did this actually fall into more of kind of some pagan, immoral sexual practices of worship? And you're thinking, how could this happen when their fearless leader, Moses, is up on the mountain with God? We need to be a people of truth, people that know the truth and not quickly forget who our God is. So what are we to do as we paddle around through life and we see those who are clinging to what they hope will float but will inevitably sink? We need to do what we continue to be doing, proclaiming the truth, the gospel. And the third thing is this, we need to know your role. Know your role. Verse 5, it says, But as for you, you kind of had this contrast here. You've just been, been told about who the, these people who were just completely reject truth and follow false. It says, but as for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. As we see that first part there of what Timothy's supposed to be, it says be sober-minded. This is clear-minded, level-headed. And instantly we'll probably all uh, quickly think about someone who is not sober but intoxicated. What, is that, what does that description of them look like? They're staggering, stumbling. And that kind of describes who these people are that are just searching for what they want to hear. 
Years ago, there was a guy that I had the chance to, to meet and have multiple conversations with. And this guy struggled with alcoholism. And many times I would find him sitting on a bench on the side of the street, just completely intoxicated. He drank so much that that was actually the title that they gave him. It was drunk and then his name because that's usually his state of mind. And I remember one, one Sunday I said, I said, I'm going to pick you up for church. Do you want to come to church with me? He goes, yes, I'll come to church. I'm like, you know what? Whether he's completely sober or intoxicated, nothing can stop Jesus. So I'm taking him to church. And so I stopped by to pick him up, and I had some students with me. And so I'm like, hey, let's, let's get going. And he had been up all night, had been drinking all night, was completely wasted out of his gourd. And I said, man, let's go. I'll help you get in my car. Let's go up. I'll take you to the church. I said, I'll sit beside you. I said, I just want you to be there. I want you to hear the truth one more time. As he goes to stand up, he starts to stagger stumbles and falls and he busts his head on the side of the curb be sober minded sober minded we're thinking clearly we're not being led astray we're not stumbling and staggering around if Timothy is to be the preacher that he is supposed to be, he needs to be serious-minded, understanding the hard work that requires him to be in that mindset. Not only is to be sober-minded, he's to endure suffering. Paul has mentioned suffering several times in this letter. And if you want to read more about Paul's suffering, go to 2 Corinthians 11, where he kind of gives you his whole list of here's all the things that have happened to me. But here's what's really interesting as you think about this. Not long after Timothy would be reading this letter, he himself would be facing suffering. As we look in Hebrews chapter 13, it says this, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released. Timothy goes to jail. He's facing suffering suffering. He's facing persecution. And so Paul timely encourages him, says, endure suffering. Don't let suffering stop you. He says, do the work of an evangelist. You may be like, oh, time out. I took the spiritual gifts test and I'm not an evangelist, so I get a pass. It doesn't say be an evangelist. It says, do the work of an evangelist. That is what Paul is encouraging Timothy to be, and that's what we need to be doing as well. What does an evangelist do? They declare the truth of the word. And this is something that all followers of Christ need to be doing. We need to do the work of an evangelist, whether we have the gift or not. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. This is something we are supposed to be doing. And he goes on and says, fulfill your ministry. I just love, we could just spend weeks on this whole thing right here because it's be sober-minded, be clear-headed, level-footed, endure suffering no matter what comes we, we withstand. Do the work of an evangelist. As God gives us opportunities, as we walk through life, no matter where we go, we're doing the work of an evangelist, sharing truth. And then we fulfill our ministry. What has God called you to do? That's what you are to be doing. Paul's encouraging Timothy. What is God has called you to do, Timothy, as a pastor? Do your job. Bill Belichick, head coach of the, of the New England Patriots has four things that he always tells his team to do. The first one is simply this, do your job. That doesn't sound real deep and real profound, but I think as we look at, at being a follower of Christ, what if we did our job? What if we did and we, we did what God has called us to do? Then my mind started going crazy when I was sitting in my office working on this message. I'm like, what if we did? What would that look like? And I thought, well, let's find out. So I need Wyatt to come on down and Zeke, if you'd come on down. So what if, what if we decided, all right, we're just going to, we're just going to use Wyatt as our example here. So Wyatt knows Jesus. Okay. Come on over here, Wyatt. All right, so if a person knows Christ, they're no longer drowning in the sea. They are now secure in Christ, and that is where Wyatt is, okay? He knows Jesus, and he is secure in Christ. Nothing can change that. You won't drown. Now, what if, starting this year, of 2022 that's coming up soon, Wyatt decides, you know what? I'm going to make it my goal that every year 
I'm going to, with God's help, lead someone to Christ and train them to do the same. One person, one year. So that's his goal. So Wyatt says, that's my goal. So he says, okay. So he has a friend named Zeke and he's like, I want Zeke's life to be changed by Jesus. So he begins to share the gospel with Zeke. So Zeke places his faith in Christ as well, which is awesome because now Zeke is a follower of Jesus. Now, there's two of them. Now, this is just one year. Now, what would happen? We got to make you secure, buddy. All right? Maybe. Maybe. Here we go. This is one year. So, in this one year, Wyatt's goal has been to, to lead one person to Christ and to train them to do the same. So, this means year two, they each go out and do this. Now, in 10 years, in 2032, here's where it's just absolutely, the math is just bonkers. It's incredible. 512 people from one. Now, that's crazy. One person who said, every year, I'm going to lead someone to Christ, and I'm going to train them, I'm going to disciple them to do the same, and then the next year, they do the same, and then that group just keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing. Now, that's one person. One. So anytime you think that God can't use one, you're wrong. Because look at what one person can do for Christ. But here's where it gets even better. What if Wyatt was like, you know what, I don't want to do this alone, but I'm going to take 24 other people with me. So 25 people make it their goal that in 2022 they're going to lead one person to Christ and disciple them and teach them and train them that they the next year can go and do exactly the same. You want to talk about some numbers that is absolutely amazing. In 10 years, if we started this in 2022, by 2032, there would be, in that 10-year time, because of 25 people from NBC deciding to do this, there would be 12,800 new believers who are trained, equipped to go change the world for Jesus. You keep running that math, the more years God gives us left on this planet. Imagine if we did that. You say, I want to change my town. It's through the gospel. I want to change our county. It's through the gospel. We want to change our state. It's through the gospel. We want our country to be changed. It's through the gospel. I want to change our world. Our world needs help. It's through the Imagine if 25 people, and be praying about this because next year, that's what we're doing. We're going to start making goals of we're going to share Jesus. We're not stopping why? Because if at the end is soon, how do you want to finish? How do you want to finish? We need to know what we're called to do and imagine the impact that can be made for Jesus. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. But here is the problem. As we look at being a follower of Jesus, the easy thing to do is to be part of what I call Lazy River Christianity. We know Jesus. Our salvation is secure in Christ. And we're just floating around. We're floating around. I mean, the sun is shining. It's beautiful. We're getting an incredible tan. The water's perfect. And we're just floating around. We're like, yep, I'm going to heaven. You are. If your faith is in Christ, you are. But is this really what we're called to do? Is this really the best there is? To just be going down the lazy river? Lazy rivers are awesome. They're relaxing. They're refreshing. And we need moments of relaxation and refreshing. Even in the Christian life, there are times you just got away from the crowds to go by himself to pray. To spend time with the Father to be renewed. To be re just to kind of be reinvigorated and to kind of get himself back to where he needs to be when it comes to following what the, the Father wants him. And we need that. But is this really the best that we can do? I'm going to say no. Because I've lived this life. I lived the lazy river Christianity for many years as a kid. Up through high school, I knew Jesus. And I was in my Christian bubble and it was all good. And that's as, that's as far as it went. But I'm thankful for a good friend who helped me realize that there's more to it. That there's more than just sitting in the tube, going through the river, waiting for heaven. That there's something else that we are called to do. 
And I am forever grateful to a friend of mine named Sam who said, hey, let's go share Jesus with people. I said, okay. Changed my life in an incredible way because I realized something. I could sit in the tube, but why am I ignoring everybody else that's drowning? Why am I doing that? We need to be realizing that if we're secure in Christ, we've got the, the life preserver of salvation, that there are many who don't. That is why yesterday we did what we did with our students. Because I want them to be prepared and equipped, but I don't want it to stop there. As a church, I want us to be ready, always. So I'm going to teach you a really quick way that you can be doing this. How you can be reaching out to those around you, whether it's somebody that you know is a good friend, whether it's a complete stranger. Yesterday, our students hit the streets of Gettysburg. We hit the square and we're sharing Jesus. Now, it's easy to get excited about it, and I love seeing students do this. And by the way, students are like the, motiv the motivation, the movement starters in our world. But guess what? You are too. You are too. If you are a blood-bought follower of Jesus Christ, your life has been changed. You've got a mission. You've got something to be doing. As you leave this morning, out in the Welcome Center, you're going to see these little cards. It says life in six words. Our students learned this yesterday, how to use these. One of our Sunday school classes did that this morning as well. And I'm like, sweet, let's do it. Real simple. It's a list of, a list of uh, 14 words. And you ask somebody. I walk up to a complete stranger and said, hey, do you have a second? He goes, yeah. I said, hey, if you look at these words, which six describe your life? And he's like, okay. He's a uh, fun, freedom, adventure, uh, purpose, routine, and happiness. I said, you know, God's one of those words. I know she didn't say that. How come? Well, let me tell you the story. Opened up. Was able to share the gospel. Our students were able to go out using this very simple tool. You can use this with somebody that's in your family. You can use it with a friend. You can use it with a stranger. Just say, hey, what do you think? Simple little question. You're not beating them over the head with the gospel. It's like, hey, what do you, what do you think? Of these six words, one guy said, you know, a lot of struggles. Got some health struggles. I said, well, we're going to pray for you for sure. I said, let's talk about, you know, the ultimate struggle. Sin. How do we, how do, how Jesus has helped. How Jesus has provided the way. By the way, the really fun part is, if you flip the card over on the back, it has a great little gospel acrostic. That you can walk somebody through of who God is, what he has done in the sending of his son. How our sins can be forgiven. How they can know for sure that they have eternal life. This is simple. This is a, it's just a great little tool. Our students were using it on the streets of Gettysburg. We can do it. Not one person that, I actually, was, that actually had a second to talk shot me down. They were curious. And it gave opportunities to share the gospel over and over and over again. So when we think about next year, we think about our next day. Can we do this? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We have a mission. It's no longer time to be sitting in the float and saying, yeah, life is good. It's wonderful. We need to realize that it's not about being on the lazy river. Will we make it to shore? If you are a follower of Christ and we, we look at the, how the, at the end of life, what is, what is next? If you are a follower of Christ and you've been redeemed, guess what? What is next is heaven. And there, where there's a sh we need to share in that celebration on the shore. But here's where it gets really fun as we go through these next couple of verses here. Look at verse 6. Because the goal is not just to get there, but the goal is to be able to celebrate what's going on. Look at verse 6. Paul says, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and my time of departure has come. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. But not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Two things that Paul gives us here that are really awesome. As he looks at the end of his life, number one, no fear. No fear. He says he knows that at the end of his life is near. He says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. This is an Old Testament offering of wine that was poured onto the altar as a lamb was sacrificed. Look back at Numbers 15 for that. Paul's final offering to the Lord, he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. He's saying, it's my life. Because Paul was a Roman citizen, he could not be crucified for his crimes, but he could be beheaded. 
And as he's looking ahead, he's probably thinking, this is how I'm going to die. And my blood is going to be poured out. He goes, you know what? It's going to be poured out as an offering to God. He says, I am all in. And if this is how God so chooses my life to end, so be it. He's not afraid. Not afraid. It's kind of interesting as you look at this. It says, my time of departure. This word for departure is really awesome. As you look at what this word means, it means to like un unyoke an oxen after they've been out working in the field. It's like to take up the, the rope from the tent that had been holding it down. It's the, the same term that is used if a ship was, was at the shore and it was tied up to take those ropes off. It's to that word for departure. And so Paul says, I know that the end is near, but I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. My question for you this morning, do you have a confidence like that? Do you have a confidence like that? You know, so many times people say, well, I've got, I know, you know, the average lifespan, I've got a few years left, I've got a lot of years left. I was talking to a guy yesterday on the streets and he was sharing with me what he believes and I said, let's run it through. I said, let's run through what you believe. I said, if what you believe is true and what you believe is right, when I die, I'm still good. But let's flip the coin. Let's go with what Scripture says. By the way, it's not what I say. It's always what does Scripture say. I said, let's run through what Scripture says. And what if you're wrong? He goes, huh. It's a good question. So I'm praying for this young man that God will continue to work in his life. That his life would be changed by the gospel. Paul has no fear. Not only that, but he has no regret. Look at verses 7 and 8. He says, the end is near. I'm getting poured out as a, as a drink offering. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. As you look at the Greek, it's really interesting because we put the emphasis on I. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the Greek, that's not the case. I is not that, that uh, it's not, that, that's not what's honed in on there, but it's more on the good fight, finishing the race and keeping the faith. He says, I fought the good fight. The struggle with sin, the struggle with self. He says, I finished this race, this course. I'm coming up to the finish line. My life is soon going to be over. He says, I've kept the faith. He says, I've been faithful to do what God called me to do. Paul lived for what mattered most. Runners in the Roman games would compete for a crown of leaves. You won the race. You'd given it all that you had. You win the race. You get this crown of leaves that in a very short time are going to decompose and dry up and be gone. Paul is, says he's, he's going for a crown that's much greater than just this simple wreath of leaves that's going to be placed on his head. He says he's running after this crown of righteousness, something that is of a eternal value. I love this. It says given by the righteous judge on that day, the day of Christ's return, it's available for all who have loved Jesus appearing. This is Jesus' resurrection. Who is it that loves the resurrection of Jesus? Those who know Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus, you could care less that he rose from the dead. But if you are a follower of Christ, it says you, you love his appearing, this resurrection that he had from the grave. You are his children. You are excited about it. You love it. This is a crown of righteousness for you. What are we living for? As Paul wraps up this letter, as he encourages this young pastor, Timothy, He's really encouraging him to press on. He's encouraging him to, to do what God has called him to do so that when that day comes, when he crosses from this life to the next, when he stands before God, that he will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In 1904, there was a man by the name of William Borden. He was in the Borden Dairy family. He was in line to take over the family business. He would have been set for life. As he finished high school, he was given a cruise to the Near East and the Far East to kind of just as a reward for graduating. While he was on that trip, he became really burdened for the people that he saw. He came back home and he spent four years in college and spent the next three in seminary. His family encouraged him and begged him, take over the family business. He goes, no, God has called me to be a missionary. As he's on his way to China, 
to share the incredible good news of the gospel. As he's passing through Egypt, he contracts cerebral meningitis, and within a month, his life is over. And we can look at that story and say, what a waste. But as they were going through his Bible after his death, they had found that it, at, through various points in his life, he had written some simple phrases. No reserves. No retreat. No regret. What about us? We get to the end of our life and we've taken the lazy river. We may look back with some regret and say, what if? Here's the deal. Day's not over. You want a true extreme sport? Because following Jesus and being obedient to him is like going whitewater rafting. It's no lazy river. But it's worth it. It's worth it. As we think about this challenge this morning from Paul to Timothy, where are you? Where are you? First question, and I ask this all the time, has there been a time in your life when you realized your need of Jesus, where you placed your faith in Him and Him alone, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you've been given a new life. Do you have that security in Christ? If today you say, Jeff, I really don't know, I want to encourage you, don't leave this building without saying, Jeff, how can I know more about Jesus? How can, my, how can I know more about my life being changed? Maybe you say, Jeff, I, I've placed my faith in Christ, but I've been on the lazy river. When I hear stories about people from our church being who God wants them to be and sharing and being that witness wherever they go, you want to talk about a pastor that gets excited. Have you been on the lazy river? It's not too late to say, you know what, I'm going to change some things. Instead of just floating around and enjoying the fact that I'm saved, I'm going to start looking around and say, who is it around me that I need to be sharing with? Maybe you say, Jeff, this morning one of the things that kind of hit me is that I need, to, I need to share. I need to talk to people about Jesus. And I can't keep it to myself. If your favorite team won the championship, you'd tell people. Your social media feed would be blowing up with how awesome your team is. I hate to tell you, your team doesn't compare to Jesus. Maybe this morning you say, Jeff, I need to I need to start sharing with people. I need to start talking to people. Use the, the life in six words card. Just start a conversation. Let's get off the raft, off the float, and just simple, easy, lazy river. Let's hit the rapids. See, but Jeff, you know what that's going to mean? Yep, I do. It's going to get a little crazy. It's going to get a little wild. A little unpredictable. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Tomorrow, Jesus could say, I'm bringing my kids home. Would you stand there with regret, saying, if only? Or would you be like Paul that says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've been faithful to do what God called me to do. Father, you know where we are. You know the things that we need to be challenged with. And God, we know that you have given us an incredible opportunity to be the ones to share your incredible message. May we do it. Help us not to fall to fear, but to use the courage that you give. Father, thank you for the opportunity you give us, that you've given us another day. That we can serve you, 
and that we can share you with others. God, may we do it. May we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.